It's time to rev up your engines. America's Car Show with Tom Torbjörnsson is on the air on WBBZ TV. Brought to you by the AAA of Western and Central New York. Get the AAA guarantee at all Western New York Car Care Plus locations. By Napa Auto Parts. Get Napa know-how. And by Dunn Tire. Service you deserve from professionals you trust at Dunn Tire. Now, here's Tom Torbjörnsson. And good evening. Welcome to America's Car Show, your car care connection. I'm Tom Torbjörnsson. Hey, we're going to make sense out of your snow tires tonight. Dr. Z will join me later on in the show to diagnose your car concerns. But first, let's take a test drive in a C-Max Hybrid. So, last time we were out here, we drove the all-electric vehicles from Ford, which consist of a Focus and a C-Max. And I was so intrigued by the experience that I wanted to drive the hybrid and compare the two different vehicles. So, once again, call on my friend Ben and Delegato. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. At Town Ford, and he's going to go through this example of a hybrid C-Max. Is that where the battery pack is? Correct. Yep, there's a little storage, and of course, there's a battery in front of that as well. So if you just open this up right here, there's a little storage in here. Mm -hmm. And then behind that is your actual battery, lithium battery. Now, one of the big things that people are really concerned about is what happens if this battery pack goes bad? Which is, a, which is totally understandable. I get it. There's all kinds of rumors as to how much they cost and everything else. And I've got my resource right here. So talk to me about this battery pack situation. Um, anything to do with the hybrid system is covered under the eight year, 100,000 mile warranty. So that includes the battery itself. Hmm. Um, the, anything under the gas powered is under the three year 36, but anything to do with the hybrid system um, is under the eight year 100,000. So it's more peace of mind, you know, especially yeah. for someone that's new to hybrids, mm -hmm. that, that gives them more peace of mind if they decide to make the investment into a hybrid. Question, does the warranty transfer with change of ownership? The, the basic um, powertrain, the 3 or 36, bumper to bumper, I should say, that's transferable automatically. It's the, the, the powertrain that would then be certified that would allow them to get the remainder of that. It would make sense that you would want to buy a certified vehicle so you could transfer the uh, warranty to the new owner because right. that's going to be a peace of mind thing Absolutely. and it's it's going to be more incentive for them to buy it. Correct. Yeah, and one of the things too is when it, in order for a vehicle to get certified, as you may already know, it goes through a like 160 point inspection, right. more so than just a regular car, it's non-certified. So that's another part of the peace of mind as well. Okay, let's show the people how these uh, decks work when they close by themselves. Sure, absolutely. You just simply just press this button right here, stand back. And the other way you can use this on your key fob itself, right. it'll have the option where you can do that by hand if you have groceries in your, your hands, you can Excellent. press that button. Yep. Excellent. Uh, hybrids, basically two forms of energy. Um, and this one's gas and electric, and it'll, it'll vary depending on your, the conditions and it also if you're over accelerating in times where you need to, it'll go from electric to gas. Okay. Um, you can maintain electric mode at 62 miles per hour in this vehicle, and you can go up to 580 miles on a full tank of gas on this vehicle. Very spacious, and one of the things uh, a lot of our clients uh, uh, like when they sit in the vehicle is you're, you're higher up, and the view is phenomenal from mm. all angles, uh, right. from the left to the front and you know, from the right. Uh, there's really hardly any blind spots on this vehicle, which is nice. Yeah. Okay, I want to take a look at under the hood of sure. this vehicle. Of course, this is your uh, 2.0 Atkinson engine, four-cylinder. Um, it, it, again, this is going to it's going to allow you to go from gas to electric, um, depending on, of course, you know the, the conditions again and your acceleration or deceleration. Um, the nice thing about that is this vehicle is self-charging. Um, whereas electric, you have to actually plug that in. Right. This is self-charging. Yeah. So there's an alternator that will help, or I should say a generator, right. that will then uh, boot, ramp up the actual battery power. If the uh, battery power goes below a certain point, it'll kick into a, a, a gas, gas automatically. There's no, there's no press of a button. It, it'll, it, it has a computer that'll tell it to do that. Yeah. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. Well, I gotta tell you, Ben, I'm uh, starting to get a little tickled at yes. the at the 
possibility of driving this. Can I drive one, please? Absolutely. You know, one thing to keep in mind, too, it has 188 horsepower, so it does have a little get up and go, and I know you do like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's go. All right, cool. Okay, driving in hybrid mode in the 2013. That's correct. Ford C Max. Yes. All right, so we've driven it all electric. Now we're going to see how this compares to the uh, all electric in in the hybrid. Now the only difference is between the two powertrains is that with hybrid, it automatically shifts between the engine and or the battery. Right, Ben? Correct. All right, that's but it's always going to seek to give me maximum fuel economy, correct? Correct. Except when you drive like that. Yeah, but again, a, very, very, very adequately powered. I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're like, a, if you're a very aggressive driver, this might not be the correct product for you because mm -hmm. you have to drive this a certain way to maximize uh, the fuel consumption. Right. Well, it is rated 47 city, 47 highway. But right. That's only if you're going to drive a certain way. Right. Yeah. In other words, no jackrabbit starts, right. easy on acceleration, exactly. staying under the speed limit. Exactly. Uh, you know, making sure the vehicle is properly maintained, all those things. Oh, really cool. Okay, I'm braking, and what's happening is there's a circle around the battery, mm -hmm. and it's showing that it's recharging it. Exactly. It's regenerating yep. it because it's, oh, cool. It's comfortable, you know? Mm -hmm. It's comfortable, it feels, it almost feels like a, um, I don't know, like mom's taxi mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know? Yeah, it's a nice commuting car. Yeah. It's kind of, it's size-wise, it's in between like a, an escape and a focus. It's like yeah. right in the middle of that. It's high and it's yeah. wide and it's adequate for, you know, elbow room. Exactly. And the vision, you know, again, it's, you know, it's uh -huh. uh, hardly any blind spots to speak of. It's very, no, not at all. Out of vision. And what blind spots you might have, it's got convex mirrors on the rear on the rear views. Mm -hmm. uh, well, to, there is an option where you can get the Bliss system, which is a blind spot monitoring system. There you go. You know, so it'll indicate on the outside of the rear view mirrors, mm -hmm. or the side mirrors, I should say. Yeah. Uh, how many power ports in the vehicle for, uh, you know, powering uh, different devices uh, and you, stuff? You should have two up front, one inside the actual um, armrest, one uh, below the actual uh, oh, yeah. okay. And then there's also a um, 110 volt plug-in back here. Inverter back there. That's right. Very nice. Oh yeah. So if you got like a PlayStation or a video games console, you can certainly do that. Look yeah. up a toaster if you need. Yeah. Let's, go, let's give a listen to the sound system, see what it sounds like. Probably ought to turn it on. Huh? Yeah. There we go. Somebody really like bass, but yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. Now, can you get navigation with this vehicle? Oh uh, yes, it is available in this particular car. Backup cam? Uh, yes, you can get it. Uh, this this car does not have the backup cam. I don't believe. Mm -hmm. I really find that very helpful. Yes, yeah, it comes in handy. I mean, I you like do have backup sensors, but there's some things that do you? It, it doesn't pick up because it's below that sensor. The camera helps with that. What kind of horsepower rating uh, in the sure, it's Ford C Max Hybrid? Yep, 188 horse. Right. A 2.0 liter engine, mm -hmm. uh, six speed uh, CVT transmission. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as, again, the gas mileage is 47 city, 47 highway. Yeah. Uh, you can maintain electric uh, uh, mode, I should say, battery mode uh, up to 72 mi 62 miles. Uh, miles an hour and if you do accelerate it will tap into the gas mm -hmm. to provide that power that you wouldn't necessarily get from the electric uh, but you could essentially keep this on cruise control and stay in, um, in battery mode uh, so then you're not using any of the gas at all. Very nice. Yeah. It's, a, it's a comfortable car. It's, yeah. it's comfortable to drive in and I like the fact that it is fuel efficient. Uh, I think it's a great family wagon, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Lithium ion, what kind of a warranty on those? Uh, sure, it's going to be a part of the eight year, 100,000 mile uh, warranty from the hybrid standpoint. Uh, but the rest of the car is covered under three and 36. Three, three years, 36, 36, five years, 60, correct. But any of the components uh, with regards to the hybrid right. is under the eight year, 100,000. 
Nice. Yep. Well, that's good because, you know, you really don't want to have to replace a battery pack oh, in this no. car. I mean, what are we talking about? Four yeah. to $6,000? Uh, yeah, in the range there, yeah. yeah. But, but by the time, you know, maybe in, in uh, five or ten more years, you won't have to uh, accrue all that cost because you're paying for that research and development. Too. Sure you are. Yeah. yeah. So, we drove the C-Max Hybrid, we drove the electric. I gotta say, for my, for my taste and for my preference, I'm a hybrid guy. Ben? Yeah, I'd have to say the same. Um, you a hybrid guy I'd too? I'd have to say a hybrid guy, yeah. yeah. The idea for me, uh, plugging uh, it in and out, you know, with the electric, it's not a bad idea, but uh, for my lifestyle, it uh, won't work. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with electric Correct. vehicles. I mean, they're fine if you want if you want to put up with what what you have to do in order sure. to to be able to drive it into maintain maximum fuel economy. Absolutely. But overall, I gotta say it's a it's a nice little car, mm -hmm. uh, run good, yep. and actually, uh, when you put it on automatic and it acts a lot like a hybrid, mm -hmm. you know, it's fine. Absolutely, it's fine. Uh, you know, I think these I think these vehicles are a great stepping stone. Mm -hmm. Uh, to the next dimension of of uh, alternative fuel. Well, agree. So. I agree. Yeah. I got to tell you, Ben, with all these hybrid vehicles and these electric-powered vehicles, you know, I used to I used to look at them with a paradigm: uh, it's a golf cart. Right. It can't possibly be a car. Right. But you know what? They've made cars out of these vehicles. Absolutely. There is uh, certainly a demand for hybrids and electric cars and Ford wants to make sure that they cover that whole gamut. Yeah. So even if it's a small market, they still want to be able to provide that for their customers. So they've done it here with two of these two different types of vehicles here today. Thanks, Ben. Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity to drive. Always a pleasure. Thank you. At Town Ford in Orchard Park, New York, I'm Tom Torbjörnson on America's Car Show. Let's talk a little bit about washing cars and some really good tips that you should follow to ensure that you get the maximum cleanliness out of your vehicle and you, you don't do any damage to it. First off, you wanna make sure you're using a very, very soft washing material, something like this, a nice microfiber sponge or you know maybe a nice plush uh, mitt, washing mitt, and you wanna make sure it's nice and clean. Second thing, well actually the first thing you should do before you even take the mitt to the side of the vehicle, rinse it down, get all the dirt and grime off of the exterior of the body because if you don't do that and you just start rubbing away, you could take that grime and that dirt that's on the side of that vehicle and actually scratch the finish. You don't want to do that. Rinse it down first, then start with a pH neutral car wash solution, which any one of them. You just take a look at them to make sure they're pH neutral, and they always are. Now, why do you want to use a pH neutral? Okay, if, if you, if, because you don't want acid in the water. Uh, I've actually seen people use dishwashing detergent on their automobiles. Not a good thing to do, because you cut so deeply into the finish, you could actually etch it. And then once you're all done, and you wash the car up really nicely, then you want to put a good wax on it to seal that finish and protect it from UV rays, etc. With your car wash tips from Napa Worldly Drive, I'm Tom Torf Jorgensen with your Napa Auto Care Minute. And welcome back to America's Car Show. I'm Tom Torf Jorgensen with your automotive news in the rear view. We have several recalls to tell you about. Let's start with one from Nissan. The automaker is announcing the recall of five different model lines due to an airbag fault. The recall covers Nissan Altima, Leaf, Pathfinder, Sentra, and the Infiniti JX35 from the 2013 model years. Nissan says the vehicles may have a problem with their occupant detection system. Simply put, the problem might not recognize a front seat passenger and mistakenly turn off their airbag, increasing the likelihood of injury in the event of a crash. 
To give you an idea of how many vehicles might be impacted by this, Nissan said more than 50,000 Altimas were sold in 2013 thus far. The company says they'll fix the problem with a new sensor. If you drive a Toyota F3 Cruiser SUV, I love those trucks, for the model years 07 to 13, you might have a problem with your front seat belts. Toyota said the rear door panels where the driver and passenger side seatbelts connect can become weak and crack over time. This could result in the seatbelt completely detaching from the vehicle, increasing the likelihood of an injury during a crash. Toyota has not detailed how it plans to fix the problem, but when they do, I'll have it here for you on America's Car Show. Subaru has announced the recall of 50,000 vehicles in the U.S. due to an unusual electrical fault that could cause a car to start all by itself. The recall covers Legacy, Outback, Impreza, and Crosstrek vehicles from the 2010 to 13 model years. Subaru says the key fob that controls the remote engine starter could malfunction if dropped causing the vehicle to start and continue running until either the key fob battery is drained or if it runs out of gas. Important to note, if a vehicle is parked in a closed area, exhaust fumes could cause asphyxiation. Subaru says it will fix the problem and replace the key fob. And finally, in this litany of recalls tonight, General Motors says certain Buick LaCrosse and Cadillac SRX vehicles from 2013 model years have an automatic transmission defect that are putting them under recall. GM says a software glitch can cause the automatic transmission to inadvertently shift from manual to automatic mode, eliminating any transmission-related engine braking effect. This could increase the likelihood of a crash, which is why over 26 thousand vehicles in the U.S. will have to get checked out. If you have a question about any of the news stories or you have a news item you'd like to know more about, connect with me, Tom at AmericasCarshow.com. And welcome back to America's Car Show. I'm Tom Torbjornson. Joining me on the set, my friend and colleague, Mike Ziglis, Hi, Dr. Tommy, Z how from are AAA. How are you today? Doing excellent. How are you? I, I'm, I'm really good. Thanks a lot. You know, we got a lot of uh, questions, so I guess we ought to get right to it, huh? Okay, let's go. Feels like the old days again. All right, Ed from Western New York writes, I own an 02 Buick LeSabre with 53,000 miles on it. Well, that's good, Ed. You probably don't drive that a lot. That's great. I purchased it new and maintained it well. Recently, the car suddenly blew a brake line. There had been no leakage beforehand. My mechanic said it just simply rotted out. Is there any kind of recall that I can take advantage of here? I called the company, and they told me, General Motors, that there is there's no liability on our part. Help me. What can I do here? Well, you know, Ed, GM has no control over where you choose to live and where you choose to drive your automobile. And if you choose to live and drive your automobile in a salt belt state, such as what New York is, using calcium and magnesium chloride, liquid sodium, rock salt, and the whole works to clean the roads off, they have no control over what it does to the bottom side of your car. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to claim any recall on that. It's just a matter of, believe it or not, regular maintenance. You got to keep those brake lines replaced and, and in good shape. And that's the way it is, isn't it? Yeah, what I tell uh, our customers and our members a lot of times, Tommy, is that, you know, go to a car wash, especially a wand car wash in the wintertime so that you can get under there and you can wash that salt off. The because right. salt is hygroscopic. And yes. even if you see, like, the white film on the cars and there's no moisture out, that salt that's on those cars are still drawing moisture into it. Absolutely. And when you've got all the little connections where the brake lines and the fuel lines hook up, yes. that sits in there and that's where it rots out and you get your problems. Absolutely. So, who do you got an answer a question for? Okay, now? I've got a question from Ed from Tonawanda. He writes that I owned a 2002 Volkswagen Passat 2.2 turbo with 140,000 miles on it. Well, that's just getting broken in. <laughs> the transmission fluid's dark brown, but it has no burnt odor or visible particles. Can I change it? I was told that changing the fluid on a high mileage transmission might cause it to fail. Is this true, and if so, why? 
Well, it basically changing the fluid on the transmission isn't going to cause it to fail because those transmissions are what we call adaptive memory transmissions now. That being said, what that means is that the fluid that's in there is a little bit thicker because of some of the clutch material and things that are in it at 140,000 miles. So when you put fresh fluid in, it's going to be thinner, it's going to be more viscous, which means it has a thinner texture and textancy to it. So when you do change the fluid, what you will know is you will know that it's shifting different for just a little bit of time at this point because it has to get adapted back to shift patterns based on the new fluid that's in it. But at 140,000 miles, I would absolutely suggest getting the fluid changed and again it'll probably take about three or four trips to the car to be able to get it to adapt to the new shift patterns with the fresh fluid and you should be all set for another 140,000 miles. Ready to rock. Those yes, electronic, sir. Those electronic systems are intuitive. Absolutely. Very interesting. Now this is a very interesting question. Janice from Cheek to Wagga writes, did the 09 Hyundai Elantra come with a V8 engine as standard, or do they have all only four cylinders? So I wish I could buy an Elantra with a V8 in it. I know, right? I would love one of those Tau motors, you know, with 429 horse and 500. Oh, I could have some fun. Sure. But unfortunately, those vehicles, the 09 Hyundai Elantra, only came with a two liter double overhead cam four cylinder with variable valve timing. So. You're going to have to settle for the four-cylinder as opposed to the eight, Janice. Yeah, that's about 138, 138 horsepower, but yeah. it'll do. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> okay, Dan from Williamsville writes, does a GMC 2003 Envoy XL SLT require two or four-wheel alignment? Well, Dan, according to uh, all the specifications that are out there in the alignment machines and in all data, uh, we do a two-wheel alignment, but that's not to say that we're just going to put a couple of gauges on the front wheels, align it, and send you down the road because the back of the vehicle, even though a solid axle, there still could be issues. There could be a, uh, a carrier for this big spring, the leaf springs, and there's a pin that locates that. If that pin breaks, the actual back end, the rear axle could shift a little bit. That could cause you an out of line condition. And I'm sure you've seen that when you're driving on the road, you see a current we call dog track. Well, if that rear end did shift a little bit, that's what you're going to get. If we merely just align the front wheels to the front, we'd never pick that up. So we always want to align the front wheels to the rear, meaning that it shoots a line down the side to make sure that all four are rolling straight for you. And there is no adjustment on the rear, but again, it would tell us if there was a problem that we'd have to repair. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate the help. Anytime, Tommy. Anytime, I appreciate it. Thanks for watching, and until next time, keep rolling.